Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capron. Uh, we're going to look this morning at a kind of a shocking story in Genesis 22, but to understand it, you need to know what happened in the last 10 chapters, starting in chapter 12, um, where God speaks to a man named Abram, his, later his name becomes Abraham, and um, makes an invitation, or strong invitation, um, that he should go from the land he's living in to another land that God will show him, which we know to be geographically modern Israel. And uh, with that is a promise that he will become the father of many, many descendants, a great nation. Um, now, the point of tension in the story is that Abraham and his wife, Sarah, do not have any children. And they are past what is usually thought of as childbearing years. Um, now people live a little longer in Genesis, so maybe not, but um, it seems kind of un unlikely from a human standpoint. And uh, then another 20, 30 years pass and still no child. And then finally, Sarah becomes pregnant and they have their son, Isaac, and that's very joyful to them. And that is the setting for this scene from Genesis 22, uh, in which God makes a request. Uh, hang on one second, do I get to the right place? Okay, Genesis 22, one through 18. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, that you've waited all this time for, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out to the place God told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to the servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound or tied up his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, same reply. Here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and in the thicket saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And so Abraham called that place, quote, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through you, through your offspring, 
all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. The end. So there are some things I'd like you to notice. First of all, consider how different our reading of the story would be if we didn't know about those last 10 chapters about Abraham and Sarah's long walk with God. There's an old saying, don't judge someone until you've walked a mile in their boots. Whenever we hear about something someone did, we never know all the events of their life that led up to that moment. Only God knows. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring light to the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. God knows all the things done in secret, and the secret reasons for things done in public. We do not need to judge. God will judge. God has it covered. But when you read a story like this, you may want to ask the question, can we trust God? Can we really trust a God who would command a father to sacrifice his son? Obviously, I'm going to argue that we can. I believe that God, the Bible shows the character of God to be amazingly generous and trustworthy. But I really want to say that to ask that question about trusting God is probably not to really understand who and what God is. It's sort of like asking if we can trust the planet. Can we trust our planet, the Earth? Well, I guess, not that we have a lot of choice. Not sure the question of trust really applies. We trust the Earth, we love the Earth, we fear the Earth. So it is with God. The thing about God is, well, God is God. Uh, and perhaps that is the only thing we can say with complete confidence. Consider these verses from Hebrews 4. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. We can't say that about any peer, anyone who is a human being like us, only about God. Genesis 22 verse 1 states that God tested Abraham. I'm exaggerating a bit here, but I almost think that it is God's existence that tests Abraham that Abraham was confronted not just by this choice from God, but by God's very nature. There is something about God that demands our complete and total allegiance. In Luke 14, Jesus told the crowd this, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. That sounds like hyperbole to me, but there is a truth in it. Our devotion to God must be thorough and complete, so much so that all our other loves seem like hatred by comparison. And so we return to our story in Genesis 22. God called his name Abraham. Abraham said, here I am. God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Abraham prepares and goes. As they are walking, Isaac says, Father. Abraham says, Here I am, my son. Isaac, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. I'm going to subtext, as God provided you to me, my son. <laughs> Abraham ties up his son and prepares to do the deed. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham said for the third time, here I am. He is told to stay his hand and not to harm his son. 
back when I was in software and engineering, we used to talk about a black box. You could know the black box's inputs and its outputs, but you didn't know what happened inside the box. Abraham is kind of a black box. In this story, we know the inputs and we know what his actions are, his outputs, but we don't know anything about what's in between. This is not a novel where we are privy to Abraham's inner feelings and thought processes. It is a story. It's also like a historical record. Literary theory would tell us that it is presented in the objective tone. And yet we cannot help but read it through the lens of our own lives. How do we narrate our lives? How do we narrate Abraham's? I'm narrating it already. From the moment I start my reading, my pacing, my inflection, my tone, I have already started introducing some of Mike into the words written on the page. And then as I preach, I take that process further. That is good. What we want to do when we read the Bible is to immerse ourselves into the story, to find points of intersection between Bible and our lives. I strongly encourage this and I try to model it for you in worship. But once in a while, we need to step back and remember that we bring things to the text that are not on the page. I suspect that as someone who is not a parent, I may read this story rather different than from people who are parents, for example. I do see this story as full of passion and dramatic tension. So that is how I read and preach it. But I could be totally wrong as I imagine that. We don't know what Abraham was thinking and feeling. Maybe he was rolling his eyes even as he raised the knife thinking, Okay, God, I'm doing the play acting you asked of me, but we both know you weren't going to let me actually go through with this. We just don't know. And ultimately, Abraham does not owe us an explanation. But the black box is also a mirror that shows us something about ourselves. If you read this story and you get angry and you want to condemn Abraham for not saying, no way! to God back in verse one. Well, that tells you something about yourself. If you read this story and you get angry at God for inflicting this anguish on Abraham, well, that tells you something about yourself. If you read this story and, or perhaps you are furious that such trauma was inflicted on young Isaac, or maybe you notice that Sarah is completely absent from the story. Abraham seems to carry out the plan without consulting her at all. Whether you view that as good or bad probably says something about how you view the roles of husbands and wives. Or perhaps you are awed and grateful for Abraham's great faith. Maybe you want your faith to grow to be like his. Well, that tells you something too. I invite you to reflect on this. When you find a challenging part of the Bible, it's a good idea to pause. If you were in my sanctuary this morning, we would, we're actually gonna take a little time to do that and talk about what we think. I won't do that, try and do that on a YouTube video. But I do note, going back to the idea of the black box, that we're never told what all of this meant to Abraham. But we are told in verses 15 to 18 what it meant to God. I swear by myself, says the Lord, because you have done this, and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations, all nations, on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. There's something about obeying God that can be holy, as long as it's really God talking to you. Speaking of not withholding sons, many years ago in 1996, I was at Moriah because we know where that is. It's actually at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And at that time, I was able to visit the Dome of the Rock, which something happened at Muhammad there, according to the Muslims, but this also seems to be the space where three religious 
traditions think that Abraham put his bound son to sacrifice him and not withhold him from God. But only one of those three religions, Christianity, believes that it was right around there that God gave God's son, Jesus, for our sake and did not withhold God's own son and made the sacrifice. One more element to include in your thoughts about this story. I pray that in some mysterious way, God blesses you through this story and my words, and that all is well with you. Amen.